Job's got a message in it, boy. I'm telling you, does it ever. It's good to be here, folks. We're meeting, obviously, again in the uh, uh, Wednesday night service without the body of Christ being visibly seated here in this auditorium. We pray that uh, the day approaches very soon when we'll be able to meet, and I pray that day is not long in the future. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to me tonight with a book of, to the book of First, uh, uh, First Peter, chapter number one, and verse one. First Peter, one one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Father, anoint your word and anoint the messenger tonight. In thy holy name, amen. We know that Peter, this is the Apostle Peter, was one of the twelve, and he was also one of the three of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John were privileged to go to the top of the mountain of transfiguration and be with the Lord. More than one time, it's mentioned how that Peter, James, and John were close to the Lord Jesus, near by him. The Apostle Peter wrote this epistle. He wrote First and Second Peter. And he had a burden to write this. Obviously, it wouldn't be in the Bible. It is inspired scripture, no question about that. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 1. Peter to the strangers. This is the diaspora, as it's called. In other words, the Jews that have been scattered to the ends of the earth. If you'll notice what it says in John chapter number 7. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? So 2,000 years ago, it was a very well-known and understood thing that many of the Jews had been displaced. They were, just, they were carried off 722 B.C., 586 B.C. into captivity. In Babylon, the Jews had prospered and there was quite a number of them. And when God brought Israel back into the land under Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel, many of these Jews stayed in Babylon. And they later wrote what's called the Babylonian Talmud. Now, of course, that Talmud is the foundation of rabbinic Judaism. But here's the problem. By staying in Babylon, they were uh, casting their lots on a Gentile nation to stay among the Gentiles. And so when Mohammed rose up 600 AD, it didn't take him long to start persecuting the Jews. And in your lifetime, in your lifetime, the Babylon is in Iraq. In your lifetime, you have seen what's happened to the Jews of Babylon. So when the Lord told them to go back, he meant it for their good. And so the dispersed of Israel, the diaspora, are still, many of them, dispersed. James 1 says, A servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So we do know 2,000 years ago, make no question about it, that there were many Jews that were scattered abroad. So if you read that, you'd think, well, now this is only to the Jews then, but it's not. The book of 1 Peter says, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, so forth and so on. But in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 14, note carefully, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust, in your ignorance. This is a direct reference to a Gentile. 1 Peter 2.10 Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's no question. These are Gentiles. 1 Peter 4.3 For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. The reason that's important is because of some of the things that are said here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3, the apostle Peter mentions the new birth. He talks about being begotten. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now the resurrection of Christ is the, is the, is the hallmark. If he had not arisen from the dead, then all the things that he said would be null and void. 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul made it as clear as he knew how. If Christ be not risen, then you're still dead in your sins and your loved ones are perished. Of course, he said, now is Christ risen from the dead. But if you notice the context of what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3, he says that we are begotten to a lively hope, note carefully, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the resurrection of Christ has something to do with your begetting, with your new birth. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. This business about Christ being Adam and type and Adam in the Old Testament a type of our Lord Jesus Christ that's important because Adam was the first man of all the men. The first man Adam was made a living soul. In Romans chapter number 5 it says that from Adam is passed down to all of us to sin and the, and the, and the curse of sin and the judgment that comes with sin. But now when Adam came forth from the earth, he took his being, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Therefore God had to come down and give Adam his life. He breathed into this handful of dirt. If you'll notice the Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, it says, The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. This means that the Lord Jesus Christ at his resurrection, according to Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 4, was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now he was called the Son of God before that. John 9 says plainly, Dost thou believe in the Son of God? The, the blind man said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? He said, I that speak unto thee am he. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. No question about that. But if you notice, it says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. From the dead, he was pointed out. In other words, there's special something special about his resurrection that relates to us human beings, and that specialty about his resurrection is where he is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That is the seal. That is the binding, the bonding, the 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 word of God, the God's promise to humanity. Notice what he says over here in uh, in the book of uh, in the book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The ministry, uh, the ministry and the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ is pre-Calvary and after Calvary. You divide them in both. You have what happens before the cross and then what happens as a result of the cross. And what the apostle is calling your attention to here is how that you are saved by his life. What life is this? This is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, whoever liveth to make intercession for us, this is saving your life. What does that mean? That means that this is saving your present life on this earth by the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. It didn't say that new birth. He's talking about saving your life. And this is what we're talking about tonight. Thanks be unto God. Romans 4.25 puts it this way. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see how the resurrection is, con is tied in with justification. Justification, the resurrection of Christ, tied in with justification. Had he not been who he claimed to be, he would not be just. He'd be a liar. He'd be an, an imposter. So the Apostle Peter goes into the doctrine of salvation. This is what we're talking about tonight. First Peter chapter number 1 and verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, 
searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand two very important things. It testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Two distinct periods of the Messiah. One is the suffering Messiah, the other is the reigning Messiah in glory. The Jews know this. The Jewish scholars that study the Word of God say there are two Messiahs. Many of them teach that because there's no way they can reconcile a Messiah who reigns in glory and suffers too. But you see, we Christians understand this. When He came the first time, He died in weakness on the cross and He suffered for us. But when He comes the next time, hallelujah to God, won't be to suffer. He'll come as the King of kings and Lord of lords to reign in His glory. So the Bible says in verse 12, And to whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel to you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So in this one short passage in the Bible, the Apostle Peter says, Prophets inquired and searched diligently. The prophet did. Didn't know. The angels desire to look into that. Didn't know. So why is that, preacher? It is because of the way God laid out the dispensation of grace that I talked about before when John the Baptist came. And when John the Baptist came, he could have been Elijah. Now in 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, note carefully, this is important, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. The apostle Peter says to the elect, he, he's, he, he's, he's, he, he sends this letter to the elect in 1 Peter chapter number 1. Now we have the elect that this letter is sent to and we have people here who are apostates that deny the Lord that bought them. This has far more to do than simply sin. Sin is sin and sin breaks the fellowship with God. This is what Peter's t or John's talking about in 1 John. If we sin, this fellowship is broken. But there's a difference between sinning and denying. What you have here, these, these false prophets deny the Lord that bought them. Two important things here. He bought them. He bought all of us. He bought every one of us. At the cross at Calvary, he even bought the creation. It all is his. He owns it, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> but you got those who deny this. And they deny his lordship. And deny the sovereignty that is associated with him. So what is this? This is an apostate. And it's bringing us up to where we are today, 2020. An apostate. What is that? Well, uh, Brother Phillips, I think his name is, used Ruth and Orpah in, the, in, the, in 2 Timothy 2.20. So, I mean, uh, 2 Peter 2.20. Turn over there with me. And you'll read what it says here. 2 Peter 2.20. I'll turn to it at the same time so you folks can... Now, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You remember how I've told you before that knowledge is a very powerful thing? What you know, what you don't know, and why you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> In verse 22, But it has happened, happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog. It didn't say the believer. It didn't say the saint. It said the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now listen to this, brother. Such people always seem to attend, able to attract a following. Sadly enough, they often win converts from the ranks of those who've been professing Christians and who have even cleaned up their outward lives. Peter warns, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, again entangled therein, they overcome the latter end is worse than the beginning. 
The Old Testament example, classic example, is that of Ruth and Orpah. Both were Moabites. This is important. Both were Moabites. Both were reared in utter paganism. Both married young Hebrew men, sons of Elimelech and Naomi. Both heard the great truth of redemption from their intimate connection with this family of believers. Both learned of a true and living God. Both lost their husbands to death. Both, both were faced with a crisis and a decision. A, a, a crisis and a decision when Naomi announced her resolve to return to the promised land and to be restored to the fellowship of the people of God. Now listen carefully. Both expressed a decision to return with her. But there is where the similarity ends. Ruth had the real thing. When her resolve was put to the test, she said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Strong words from a Moabite. Orpah took a few steps along the right path that led to Boaz, to the promised land, to a place among the people of God. But then she turned back. She kissed Ruth and Naomi goodbye and turned back to Moab, back to the dark, back to the demon gods of her people, back to the pagan lifestyle of Moab. God blots her name from his book thereafter, and we read of her no more forever. She had a profession, but it came to nothing. Ruth also had a profession, but she had more. She possessed the real thing and came into the full knowledge of redemption, purchased for her by Boaz, which is a beautiful story. Boaz, a type of Christ, and I recommend you read the book of Ruth sometime. That mighty man of wealth, that wondrous Christ-like kinsman redeemer, that's a beautiful thing, the Goel. Peter warns against being like Orpah. To learn enough about Christ, to make a profession, to make the initial moves. Listen carefully. This is what Peter's warning about. To clean up one's outward life of its worst abuses. To stop drinking, smoking, swearing. For example, to give up stealing and immorality. It all may be mere profession. To start going to church, to be baptized, to have a testimony, to say all of the right things, do all the right things. Also may be a mere profession. Orpah turned back. That was her final, real, and determining decision. Her latter end was worse than her beginning. And I have never heard it put better than this. Listen to these words. To begin with, she was a Moabite by birth and by practice. In the end, she became a Moabite by choice. That's apostasy. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Thus the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 2.19. I want to finish with this tonight. The Apostle Peter talks about a fiery trial. We know by studying the history of it that Nero lit up his orgies by taking Christians and dousing them in inflammable liquid or whatever it was and held them up and used them as, as torches and lights for his, for his orgy. Nero was a demon-possessed, murdering devil. And so the Apostle Peter tells them, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Remember now. Remember. The Apostle Peter has taken the theme of salvation he has said with this theme, either you are a true believer or you're not a true believer. And now he goes into the fiery trial that shall try us. He said, but inasmuch rejoice as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. For on their part is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For time is come 
that judgment must begin at the house of God. I don't like this. I don't like this a bit. We live in a lost, dark, pagan world. And we live in a lost, dark, pagan country. This country, whether it's crossed the line, whether it's, whether it's gone too far, I don't, that's God's, God makes that call. I don't know that. I'm just a preacher. But it's getting close. It's getting mighty close tonight. And there's a plague out here. There's a plague. And that plague is taking a lot of people from this earth. It's causing a lot of people to think. I want to give you four things tonight I want you to think about when I close. Four things. First of all, I don't believe the world will ever be the same as it was. Never be the same. Number one is identity. You will be scrutinized as to who you are. Number two, contact tracing. They will scrutinize not only who you are, but where you've been. Number three, a vaccination. That vaccination is supposed to be is supposed to be is supposed to come out and help us with, with the plague. But you can do a lot with vaccinations. And number four, your liberty. That First Amendment of the Constitution, the Second Amendment of the Constitution. The governor of Virginia, first thing he did was take away the Second Amendment of the Constitution. I don't know how much completely, you know, he did, but he assaulted it. He went, to, he went against what has that got to do with a virus? Think about it. Many of, the, many of the governors in this country have shown themselves to be decent, upright, uh, honorable people who recognize the Constitution of the United States. Many of them, though, you're beginning to see what happens when people have power. You put the wrong person in power, dear friends, you will open the gates of hell into your life. Pray, pray that if it comes, that you'll stand against the wiles of the devil, that your faith will stand, even if it costs us our lives, our faith will stand, that we will not leave, that we will do as, as uh, Ruth did, where you die, I'll die. My salvation is worth more to me than anything else in this world. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And before I close tonight, I'd like to mention that uh, Brother uh, Arsenault, Chris Arsenault, is having surgery tomorrow. So please remember him in prayer. He's having, I think, back surgery. He's had a time with this. It's been a, it's been a long, drawn-out thing. And then Brother Beck, his son, uh, Daniel. 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 He's going to have surgery in a few weeks, uh, just a few days, really. And, uh, and please pray for him, these two, with, with surgeries tonight. Father, thank you for your word. It will not return to you void. It will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is joy to my soul. To eat it tastes like honey, but sometimes once we eat it, it can give us a bellyache. And God, we pray tonight that you bless your word to each one who've heard it now. In thy holy name, amen. God bless you. We'll meet again Sunday, Lord willing.